History at James Madison University, where she is also co-director of the JMU in Argentina program. Dr. McCleary earned her PhD in Latin American history, a master's degree in history, and a master's degree in Latin American studies from UCLA. Her undergraduate degree in English and American literature with minors in visual studies and Spanish is from the UC San Diego. She is widely published on topics including performance, theater, ethnic identity, and other cultural topics in historical Latin America. I'm very pleased to welcome Kristen to join us today, and I'm eager to hear a Latin Americanist reading of the Monroe Doctrine, 1823 to 2023. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. And thank you everyone um, for having me. I was very excited to get this invitation. Uh, so as Sarah mentioned that um, you can ask questions and she will flag them for me. And I prefer to have a conversation as much as possible. So I'm happy to, to give that a try. Uh, so, yeah, this was exciting for me. I am a cultural historian and I teach um, mainly Latin America, but also U.S. and Latin American relations. And I have been teaching that class on and off for close to 20 years. And when I first started teaching the class, I kept noticing this Monroe Doctrine coming up in a variety of ways. And so what I wanted to do today is kind of do two things, cover a little bit of my interest of popular culture from the US side and to highlight where I kept seeing the Monroe Doctrine come up in my classes and the things that we were reading and watching. And then the second half will definitely be emphasizing um, Latin American intellectuals, writers, and artists, and how they respond to the Monroe Doctrine. So I will just say, I think I've got a very wordy PowerPoint that I'll be sharing here. I'm just going to talk over it. And so um, there will be more information on the PowerPoint than I, I don't want to just read it, but I wanted it there if people were interested. So I'm just going to kind of highlight some of the ideas that are on the PowerPoint, and we will go ahead and get started with the first part of my exploration of the Monroe Doctrine. So this is, um, I just kind of set up these questions. How has the, you know, let me get my camera fixed here. How is the uni unilateral doctrine? I am going with the unilateral doctrine of the Monroe Doctrine, um, meaning you know one-sided from the U.S. Continued to be so relevant over 200 years, and then the second half will be how have Latin Americans responded to the doctrine. So in this first part, I am just going to address um, three examples from the U.S. popular culture in the 1930s, 1940s, and going all the way more or less to the present with an episode of Modern Family that invoked the Monroe Doctrine to kind of suggest how um, education and representation has been part of how the Monroe Doctrine has maintained uh, its importance. And then I'll shift to how Latin Americans have viewed the Monroe Doctrine. So um, again, I am emphasizing, I think, cultural approaches to the Monroe Doctrine over a history of diplomacy. So that is a little bit of my angle here. Beam. So, um, but before I, that's right, before I get to that, I did go ahead and said, I wanted to, you know, just share with you some of my starting points with the Monroe Doctrine. And I will not read through all of this, but some things to keep in mind of the historical context as we move forward is as a Latin Americanist, it is I understand that more European countries were coming into the Western Hemisphere than just, um, you know, Spain and at the time, but it's hard for me to think about the Monroe Doctrine without that timing of it, where it's just issued right on the heels of independence from a variety in most of Latin American countries, um, Brazil from Portugal, and most of Latin America from Spain has independence, with the exception of Cuba and Puerto Rico, which I'll mention later. So for me, the Monroe Doctrine does definitely seem to be connected to these independent independence movements and declaration of independence of Spanish America in particular. Um, the second point I would make is just that, you know, the Monroe Doctrine isn't called a doctrine immediately at the time. 
And I also think that is significant because the Monroe Doctrine becomes a doctrine. And that gives us insight into part of its staying power is that its meaning changes, the terms we use to talk about it change and evolve over time. Um, so I will also say, so I kind of just covered that it amasses meaning over time. It It's not at the beginning something that, you know, everyone's paying attention to. And I just put one example from the country I study, right, Argentina, where England goes into the Western Hemisphere and the U.S. really doesn't care and doesn't do much. So there's another element to the Monroe Doctrine. I think it really does emphasize the countries, the, the U.S., in this doctrine cares most about the countries that are close to the United States, the Caribbean and Mexico in particular. Um, I would also say from the Latin American point of view, it's hard for me to not view the Monroe Doctrine as a moment in which the United States you know, really does begin to assert its ambition uh, as a power player in the Western Hemisphere. I was lucky enough to attend the Monticello talks on the Monroe Doctrine. And I do understand that in the moment, this declaration could be seen or interpreted as a sign of solidarity between the U.S. and Latin America. But I think I'm going to make a case to say that I think there was a little bit more happening um, at the time that is connected to U.S. growing power and ambition in the Western Hemisphere. So two last points, I believe, before I get to my um, topics, uh, this the one of the ideas that marks the Monroe Doctrine as a ambitious statement from the U.S. is this unilateral decision. Um, I will argue later that there have been times and opportunities to bring in Latin America to some kind of hemispheric unity and cooperation, and that doesn't exactly happen. Uh, the more kind of interesting point that I have been able to see more clearly through the work on the Monroe Doctrine is really thinking about the whole history of the U.S. in Latin America and the Caribbean um, in the early 1800s as just marking this regional realignment of power away from Europe. And that happens before 1822 and 1823. So thinking of a Mon a James Monroe and um, the, you know, the work that he did with the Louisiana Purchase. And once that the Louisiana Purchase had been made, which Monroe negotiated, there were questions about Florida. Was Florida part of that or not? So um, the this kind of early 20, 19th century is an era of expansion and just regional realignment where Spain and France are just fading away and losing territory or selling territory to the growing U.S. So I think if we look at the larger regional realignment, we're seeing um, the, the, the ambition of the United States or just the expansion of the United States. So the Monroe Doctrine being a first step into more pronounced um, man expressions of manifest destiny that will follow later. So let's turn to my, um, my great interest in popular culture. And I just wanted to go over three areas where I've seen the Monroe Doctrine uh, pop up in kind of unexpected places. Uh, one is in a film that is called Juarez that talks about uh, Benito Juarez, the first indigenous president in Mexico, who himself faces a civil war at the same time that the U.S. is fighting a civil war. This film is made in 1939, and it is a product of the good neighbor policy. So, you know, this interesting question of why and when the U.S. turns to make a film about Mexico and um, invokes the good neighbor policy. So, you know, the three examples I'll give are kind of, I'm just trying to suggest some ways in which popular culture gives meaning to the Monroe Doctrine over time as well. So um, again, the film war is made in the, during the era of the good neighbor policy is actually telling a historical story. And it is a real story in which during the US Civil War, 
France is looking to gain foot in the Americas and um, with Napoleon III figures out a way to kind of maneuver around the Monroe Doctrine when the U.S. is very busy with its own civil war and not in quite the um, political space to be protecting the Americas from European intervention. And so the film tells a story of how Napoleon III um, and the film gives his wife some credit, Empress Eugenie, um, managed to manipulate a situation where they work with the conservatives in Mexico to install um, Maximilian, who is a M Habsburg emperor, into the throne of Mexico in um, 1862, 1863, um, throughout 1867 or so he is um will be in mexico and the um film opens with the monroe doctrine in the very first scenes of the movie um empress eugenie which is a kind of a interesting decision that she is the one who comes up with the plan that she pitches to her husband to get um some foothold from France through this Habsburg connection into Mexico. And she basically says in the film that if they can work with Mexicans, it's really not a violation of the Monroe Doctrine to install this emperor in the seat of Mexico. Um, and so what was interesting to me about the film was just the the really fine-tuned examination of the Monroe Doctrine and figuring out that this was not a violation so much as a workaround of the Monroe Doctrine, because the Monroe Doctrine doesn't say that you can't have, um, you, it, the Monroe Doctrine doesn't allow to mess with the internal affairs of a nation. So if Mexican conservatives invite Maximilian to sit on the throne, that seems to be a good workaround. Um, so the whole film is about this. It is about the rise and fall of Maximilian and Benito Juarez in Mexico. Within the discussion of the Monroe Doctrine, um, always is attention to democracy. So in the film, the um, opening five minutes, Napoleon III talks about the inefficacy of democracy. And so again, um, kind of pitching current political events, talking about the power of Europe to, in the 1930s and 40s, right, to invade again, um, working on those two levels. Other elements that I love about the film, um, Juarez, Juarez tends to not even be the main character, but when Ever we see Benito Juarez, who is played, I have to say, in brown face by Paul Muni, there is a close connection between um, Juarez and Abraham Lincoln. And so I just had two images I found. There is always, almost always, a portrait of Abraham Lincoln behind Benito Juarez. And Benito Juarez, again, in the film, wears the Lincoln-esque hat in many scenes. Even when he has to flee in one scene, he makes sure that he carries Lincoln's portrait. Um, there's correspondence between the two presidents depicted in the film. And um, this, again, always kind of underpinning democracy to the question of European imperialism is a big theme of the film. I wanted to also show that, um, again, out of time here, like this isn't chronological, but the the event of Maximilian in power in Mexico and then being executed in Mexico arguably did more than the Monroe Doctrine to keep Europeans out of the Western Hemisphere. Um, Edouard Manet depicted the execution, which is how Maximilian's story ends, um, in this painting that was painted on the heels of the actual event. And this really shook up Europe to understand that uh, there was a strong penalty and price to pay for intervention. But that penalty was not imposed by the United States, but by Mexico itself. So I just wanted to kind of add that in. So we have lots of layers. Um, so let us let me turn quickly to my second area of um, US popular culture. And that is, we're gonna shift again, 
in real time, this overlaps with the making of the movie of Juarez, um, a important Chicano writer, folklorist, or Mexican-American, Américo Paredes, wrote a novel based on his own upbringing on the U.S. Texas or U.S. Mexican border in Brownsville, Texas. And so I just wanted to show a couple passages of his kind of biographical novel called George Washington Gomez, where he too addresses the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, he is known, renowned, he was a professor for writing a lot about popular culture and bringing in uh, corridos or ballads, folk ballads along the border into his uh, scholarship. Um, but this novel that I'll now turn to is autobiographical and gives insight into what it was like to grow up in this kind of hybrid identity along the border of U.S. and Mexico in Brownsville, Texas. Um, so I will just kind of jump to the passage where he brings in the Monroe Doctrine. And I am fascinated by the juxtaposition of these two, of the story and the film, because again, they overlap, they take place at the same time, and they also um, invoke the same story, Juarez, the Monroe Doctrine, and the U.S. Civil War. And so um, the story of George Washington Gomez goes into, the main character is George Washington Gomez, but his nickname is Gualinto. And so the story goes into Gualinto's experience in a public school in Southern Texas, which is a segregated by language, not by race. And in this story, the main character, Gualinto, clearly excels. He's very smart and he um, is a high achiever. And so he was going to emphasize, as the quotes I will offer show, a similar idea of democracy that we saw in uh, Juarez, but from a different viewpoint or angle. So in the story, we get um, insight into Gualinto's education, and he is learning about the Civil War. And quite smartly, Miss Barton, his Anglo teacher, actually does what probably many teachers in the U.S. don't necessarily do, and that is introduce um, an element of the Civil War that intersects with Latin America. And so she teaches and gives an assignment about how the Mexico is fighting the French um, and against Maximilian during the U.S. Civil War and in defiance of the Monroe Doctrine, right? So that is centered at the beginning of this assignment is the Monroe Doctrine. And she introduces Gualinto's oral report on the Franco-Mexican War. And Gualinto enters and he tells the story of um, that Juarez the film told, how the French land in Veracruz, he tells the history of Cinco de Mayo, which I still have to remind my students is not Mexican independence, but it is a celebration of Mexicans defeating the French at this time. Um, so he's very proud of his essay. And at the end, he says, our history book does says it was the United States who made the French leave. And he's going to correct them. It is not true. It was the Germans. Um, he brings in his colloquial English it, who were ready to whack the tar out of the French. So Napoleon III pulled out his troops and left Maximilian holding the bag. Um, Briefly, I will just say that in this excerpt is also a section where they talk about the classroom as being democratic. So always democracy is part of the story of the Monroe Doctrine, no matter how it's pitched. And here, um, the, the class is democratic. It was a two, true democracy. And Gualinto is poor and you know, getting his education, but he is smarter and ranks higher in this classroom than the wealthiest. And that's kind of the point of this section that I want to have. So we, we see some patterns and some themes between these two examples. Um, so the third example is jumping far ahead in time. And I'm just going to say, how happy I was watching the modern family when modern the Monroe Doctrine popped out at me. Uh, so the Monroe Doctrine or the Modern Family, it's a multi-family sitcom that um, brings in a lot of history and reference, and it's it's very humorous. So I will just briefly say how the Monroe Doctrine is integrated in a 2018 
episode um, from the ninth season of Modern Family. Uh, the Dunphy family here is the one that is going to tell us a little bit about the Monroe Doctrine. I have Luke above uh, the sun saying that he may have to drop his history class because this paper is due tonight and he forgot to start writing it. And what is it about? Well, it's about the Monroe Doctrine. Um, all of a sudden in, in the in the TV show, the mother Claire, pictured below, is very excited because she is a high achiever, a perfectionist, and it just so happens that she remembers, not surprisingly, that she wrote what she called the perfect paper about the Monroe Doctrine, but she got a C on it. So she is looking to get that uh, another um, professor to regrade it. She has no scruples in giving her son her paper um, so that she can prove to everyone that her paper is um, indeed an A paper and not the C that she got on it 20 years ago at the time. So um, there's a lot made in this episode about how technology changes and because she's so ambitious to get this paper regraded, she spends a lot of time trying to figure out how to get it from her, um, you know, her old floppy disk drive to a new drive in computer and to, to get it submitted for her son. Um, what she does say, the only thing that we get here is that the... Um, she remembers European imperialism. That's about it. So she talks about remembering that the certain president had a problem with injustice and European imperialism. So takeaways here, and they're, they're brief, but my examples are brief. I just want to suggest that it is no kind of surprise that we see the Monroe Doctrine popping up again over and over in U.S. popular culture. Um, I would think that one thing that we would learn is that, and I looked, I could not find, but I am guessing as early as we've had a curriculum across the U.S. in history, the Monroe Doctrine has been a key part of that curriculum. Um, we find that the Monroe Doctrine is attached to democracy and imperialism, but not U.S. imperialism. Through teaching the, the doctrine, we're going to get a kind of through line of um, oversight of U.S. imperialism and keeping the eye on uh, European imperialism. So the de democracy is also a part of how we see the Monroe Doctrine in popular culture. I mean, there's even a line that Claire says that it's like, oh, leave it to a man. We have to call it a doctrine because, you know, a man made it up. There's even in the Filmora's and the Monroe um, Doctrine episode of Modern Family, a little bit of feminism injected into what is usually a male story. So, uh, Democracy is part of how we see this. I think we just see the continuity and the integration in these examples of the Monroe Doctrine through our educational system. And that allows a common thread to be woven over time. Uh, there also is that emphasis on democratic values that we still see, we struggle with, where the US talks a lot about democracy in Latin America, but sometimes works against it, but that's another story. So um, those were just kind of some of my brief highlights. And if there's no questions or comments, I'll return to how Latin Americans respond. Do we have a question or comment? Yeah. Sorry, I was struggling to unmute myself there. We did have a question. Um, that I missed in real time and had to apologize um, uh, to Mr. Lopez who post, posed the question. Um, if you don't mind, it's a little bit going back to the framing of the Monroe Doctrine itself. Um, uh, I will, see if I can do that. Is yeah. that okay? I'll read sure. you the question. Um, I would like to know more about the Monroe Doctrine in the context of Euro-American settler colonialism, especially as it relates to indigenous nations of the Americas and the contemporary international indigenous human rights arena. If you're willing to feel that, uh, you know, um, not the same as the popular culture you were just talking about, but um, if you're willing to take that. Well, I wonder, um, so that is a big question, right? 
European settler colonialism and indigenous rights. I wonder if I kind of get to addressing it here. And again, I'm going to say right now, I'm not sure if I could exactly, I think that's a great question. I, I'm not sure if I could pitch it entirely that way, but what if I go ahead and start talking about the Latin America position? Um, and then I think we could come back to that. And I would love to hear, you know, if it was Mr. Lopez's ideas about that. Um, it, it's a it's a thread woven into some of the, I think, reactions of Latin America and Latin Americans. I don't explicitly address indigeneity, but I think through um Jose Marti in particular, we get at some ideas of racial difference. So that might help me. I know I'd only have like 15 minutes. So let, let me see if I can think about that and emphasize some of those um, themes through this, com this conversation. And then it would be great in the last few minutes if we could have a broader conversation about this as settler colonialism. I haven't quite thought of it in those terms, but I know I'm gonna touch on some of the concerns with this. So is that okay? My apologies, can't exactly address it, but let's think about that um, through this other lens of how Latin Americans respond to the legacy of the Monroe Doctrine. And I would say that probably from the get go, I, you know, again, I found different responses that, yeah, from the declaration, some Latin American countries did try to use this doctrine as um, a way to get US maybe involved and protect against European dominance or European influence. But um, the really kind of key moment, I would say, where we see the beginning of a separation it has to do with this Panamanian conference of 1826 that was convened by one of the great leaders of uh, Latin American independence, uh, Simon Bolivar, who um, here conv convenes the first American meeting, hoping to strengthen cooperation among the new republics. Simon Bolivar did look very fondly upon the United States. He at the time, he wished that South America could be united in a way on um, modeling the United States where a lot of states came together under one kind of um, nation, right? So uh, even the United States, just FYI, admired Simon Bolivar. At some point, I found that we have a lot of towns named after Simon Bolivar in the United States, including one in Western in West Virginia that comes out of these um, questions and these dialogues that are happening in the 1820s. But I would argue here that from the beginning, the United States um, kind of reluctantly joins this Panamanian Congress. And from the beginning, it seems pretty clear that the US wasn't going to work with Simon Bolivar's vision of hemispheric cooperation. Um, and so I, I think, you know, from really early on, after the heels of the Monroe Doctrine, the United States um, is basically saying, we will go to this Congress, but we will not make any agreements to anything that will prevent us from acting amongst upon, with our own interests foremost in mind. And that was not the vision that Simon Bolivar had with hemispheric uh, cooperation. So from the very beginning, kind of the examples I'm gonna give are how Latin American Latin Americans begin to um, embrace more this idea of pan Latinidad, which is um, you uh, kind of what makes us uh, share I ideas that are separate from the United States. And so the examples that I that I have will kind of show that. So again, I know I don't have. Um, a lot of time, but let me just give you a couple examples. Another element that makes the Monroe Doctrine so powerful and so kind of continual is that it has a lot of corollaries. And I just wanna mention, I'm gonna kind of give a couple examples of corollaries 
um, which you can read, you know, what they are, but then I want you to, to show the Latin American re reaction to it, because it's not just going to be Simone Bolivar in 1826 thinking about the U.S. and the Monroe, what was then, you know, this kind of more speech that Monroe had given, um, but it's all these other moments in history where the doctrine gets more teeth and gets stronger and the kind of difference from Latin America is, is emphasized. So this this first one is the um, only corollary in 1895. Um, that kind of strengthens it and that, you know, only says the US is practically sovereign over the continent. Um, and Jose Marti reacts to this idea of the US uh, being sovereign in the co continent. Jose Marti actually will die in 1895. This is a statue of him in New York City, and apparently it is depicting the moment of his death in battle in Cuba. Um, but Jose Marti is a very fascinating figure who fought for Cuban independence, a writer, intellectual, but who lived in the United States for, I believe, about 15 years. And when he was in the United States, he was at first admired the democracy, but then witnessed the kind of racism that um, that took place and the segregation of, you know, African Americans and um, white U.S. Anglo people, if we might use the border term. And it framed him and his ideas in certain ways that he um, will bring into his writing. So he, for example, his most famous one writes about the U.S. Um, is saying, I know the monster because I have lived in its lair and my sling is that of David. He knows that the United States is looking to incorporate Cuba. Um, this the cartoon that illustrates that is two years after he his death. But I think this kind of the idea of that corollary that I just mentioned, he's very much aware of that. He's very much aware of the United States power in the region. Um, so one of the favorite pieces of writing that he does is, again, published. It's all around the same time, Our America. And in Our America, he highlights a distinction of the U.S. as part of America versus Latin America. Um, so just my main point here is that we'll see with the increasing power of the United States and the increasing corollaries to the Monroe Doctrine and increasing identification of Latin Americans as something different than the U.S. So again, this word America is shared by all from North America to South America. But when Jose Marti publishes Our America, he is talking about um, Latin America, what we call Latin America today. And there's a variety of ways in which he illustrates that. He basically argues against his own elite in Latin America, that they're too much looking after the US and France, but we his, his guide or guidance and advice is we need to see who we are to be good rulers and rule after our own countries rather than being so fixated on these external powers. Um, he also says something that I would say is very relevant today. Um, this, in, this is in particular to the US, the scorn of our formidable neighbor who does not know us is our America's greatest danger. Um, and he says, you know, through you know ignorance, um, it might even come to lay its hands on us. Um, once it knows us, however, it will remove its hands. There's always a sense of optimism. Once the U.S. knows us, then things will be better, right? And here he touches. I did want to bring this in because Marti has um, is shaped by the U.S. and what he sees, as well as Latin America, which has a racial hierarchy. Um, but he says, you know, he he demands that we think beyond race. And this is in the 1890s. The soul, you know, knows no race. It is equal and eternal, emanates from bodies and different shapes of colors. Um, whoever foments and spreads antagonism and hate between the races sins against, sins against humanity. Um, 
again, I will just kind of cut to the chase here. Mart Marti's greatest fears about the U.S. intervention are realized. They're realized after he dies, and they're realized after the Spanish-American War of 1898, when the U.S. puts into place the Platt Amendment, um, be, you know, over Cuba. becomes Cuba becomes a protectorate of the United States. Um, and I've always, when I teach the Platt Amendment, I have always viewed it as a mini Monroe Doctrine for Cuba, right? And because it's there saying that the U.S. has the right to intervene in Cuban affairs should another uh, foreign power come in. So um, it gets repealed in 1934. I think most of you probably know the history of the U.S. and Cuba after that. Um, so I will let you think about that. <laughs> The next, if I have, let's see, five more minutes, maybe I can just kind of get to the Roosevelt corollary because that is yet another corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, which reminds us of this increasing power of the United States um, uh, in, the, in Latin America and the Caribbean. So I just found this cartoon that leads up to the Roosevelt Corollary, um, where, you know, Venezuela is complaining to Uncle Sam about, again, the intervention of Germany here. And Uncle Sam is explaining the Monroe Doctrine will protect Venezuela, but Venezuela must still pay its debts. Um, so, you know, Two years later, Panama, we have the Roosevelt Corollary um, passed in the Western Hemisphere, uh, you know, says that the you, the Monroe, the, the Roosevelt Corollary says the U.S. will intervene to take care of debt so that Europe doesn't. Um, and this gives more reason for the U.S. to intervene in the Caribbean, which I just found online. Uh, maps.com maps for um, just to give a visual to that, right? I always like to point out Haiti, that for almost 20 years, the U.S. occupied Haiti, which is something we don't really often talk about, and the Dominican Republic. Um, so I want to show a reaction to that, though, that Ruben Dario, the great modernist poet from Nicaragua, who worked and lived in the country I study, Argentina, writes a poem and once again builds on Jose Marti, builds on um, Rodeau who wrote Ariel from Uruguay to basically say, you know, if only you knew us, maybe this would change, these relations would change. So the poem by Dario is called To Roosevelt. Um, it is written in the wake of the Roosevelt's invasion of Panama as Panama is wrested from Colombia to uh, create the Panama Canal. And I'll just share um, a couple of ideas here. Of the, the poem highlights this increasing separation from Latin American identity to uh, the US identity. And in this passage and the one that I have next, Roosevelt and the U.S. become, they're the hunters, they're aggressive, are the symbols that are used. Primitive and modern, simple and complicated. Um, they're invaders, right? That Dario just says that. Um, compared to Latin America, again, our America of Marti, but here built upon by Dar Dario, who says we are here, we are indigenous, right? We pray to Jesus. So we are Catholic, we are Christian, and we speak Spanish. So these elements of contrast and many more in this poem. Um, but I highlighted the part on the right and it's, you know, like, but be careful, Roosevelt, be careful. Um, there are a thousand cubs loose from the Spanish lion. Roosevelt, who would have to be through God himself, right? Um, you would ha It would be difficult to grab us in your iron claws. And although you count on everything, you lack one thing, God. 
as a Latin Americanist and knowing U.S. history of um, the Cold War, I was really struck by this idea that the belief in religion is what separated uh, Latin America from the U.S. Because in the Cold War, the U.S. uses that against the Soviet Union. So this line has always struck me as very interesting. Um, that, But in general, Latin Americans are presented as... Um, more spiritual, more religious. And I guess if I push it, I can have my brief, you know, introduction to Frida Kahlo, who I argue in her portrait, again, here moving to the 1930s, builds on this um, increasing notion of, of separation between the border. So I, I've always loved this portrait that um, Frida Kahlo does uh, as she spends time with Diego Rivera in, um, I believe they're in Detroit, Michigan at this point. And she is able to kind of think about um, what is different for her between the US and Latin America. Here she's focused on Mexico, but I still see, you know, to Roosevelt, the poems in this, as we see her poem, um, or not, excuse me, her painting, that she's, you know, looking at the viewer and saying, what, what do you see here, right? What are the differences between Mexico and the United States? I usually make my uh, students tell me what the differences are. So maybe we can leave that for part of our discussion. But I did um, have a few conclusions um, as I kind of mashed together these two perhaps very different ideas, right? Uh, coming from U US popular culture and Latin America, trying to understand a little bit more of the staying power of the Monroe Doctrine in the US and then how Latin, I think, you know, if I take some liberty with it, uh, it doesn't feel like I have to take too much liberty with the Monroe Doctrine to say, I think these great kind of intellectuals and artists and writers use it to shape a Latin American identity, to say we're different. We see the Monroe Doctrine as ambitious from this new US Republic. And by the way, we've been in the Americas or the Spain has been in the Americas for twice as long as the English ever were um, with this kind of deep roots. So just a couple points from my conclusion. I believe the Monroe Doctrine is, for me, a convenient moment to see this growing separation of identities, to see the kind of lament of Simon Bolivar um, for Latin America to not follow in the heels of this idea of the United States, but also a, in a lament that the United States didn't want to have the same hemispheric cooperation that he envisioned. Um, the identities that I like to teach about because my students never think about what the U.S. looks like in Latin America. And I'm always like, yeah, we kind of look like this big Frankenstein that's, you know, walking around and can't control its movements, or we're a big puppy that creates problems without really intending to, um, versus the, the contrast of Latin America being traditional, deep-rooted, authentic, and I guess more intellectual, right? Um, the popular culture element from the U.S. just wants to highlight that the life of the Monroe Doctrine is beyond the diplomacy. It is beyond U.S. Latin American relations and politics, and it is in embedded in our curriculum and our film and our television. Um, I was so happy to hear the Monroe Doctrine and Modern Family because I'm sure the writers were like, what can we talk about that will show the same assignment over a 20 year difference? It's the Monroe Doctrine. Um, the US emphasizes democracy, European intervention, and I would say US-Mexican relations. Uh, Latin Americans identify against the Monroe Doctrine, anticipate the power of the US, but ultimately can't overcome the power of the US. All right, see if you guys all bought that. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear thoughts. Let me jump in while people are thinking about their questions and just say thank you. I feel like, oh my gosh, all these perspectives and um, really nicely brought together. And also, um, I love the use of political cartoons to get those moments um, in uh, sort of the 
hybrid of political and popular commentary, yeah. right? Because they are political topics, but they are intended for um, a wide ranging audience to, to really connect with those key pieces. I mean, that's what good political cartoons do, yeah. right? Is get those like little crystallized pieces. Yeah, exactly. Um, I didn't want to go, there are a lot of great ones and Puck has another magazine cover of the Monroe Doctrine, um, but I didn't want to do too much uh, But with that because there are so many other areas, but you're right, a good political cartoonist has to really um, distill an idea into an image and that image was pretty powerful. Yeah, so. in order for it to resonate with people who are yeah. familiar at least with some broad view. So let me ask you while while we're still um, uh, in a moment before people are putting questions, you know, looking at these two, and as you said yourself, not quite parallel visions of the Monroe Doctrine and its impacts, um, the popular culture and the Latin popular culture in the United States and the Latin American view <coughs> of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, what do the points of overlap tell us about U.S. Latin American relations, or maybe the points of non-overlap, um, however you want to approach it? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't want to use the word propaganda, but it comes to mind, especially with um, the kind of the Juarez film and even, you know, the continual, the continual, the continual focus on the Monroe Doctrine, which is so embedded in curriculum, but I would love to see um, something maybe selfishly, right? Like what I presented is, let's you know think of the Monroe Doctrine and all of the other changes that um, my students, you know, did a lot of research thinking about how it changed over time and was given more power through these corollaries, right? And then this kind of Latin American response, right? To flesh it out a little bit. So I do think they are related in that the Monroe Doctrine, if you take my interpretation of it, of it being like a, um, a signpost marking, you know, US, I've arrived and we have a plan, ambition in the region uh, that the, um, Let's see if I, I lost my thought there. So that this is a big moment and that if we look at the later representations of the Monroe Doctrine through popular culture, we are reminded that the U.S. tends to not look too hard beyond our own border for what other people are maybe thinking about that, right? So I, I and even, you know, Jose Marti is just hoping that if you, the U.S. knew us, they would they would you know respect us a little bit. Um, so again, sorry, that's a Latin American point of view, but there's always this desire that that I see happening a little bit more now with film and, and television in the U.S. That um, if you you know bring in people who who are from Latin America or experts in uh, the region and new Latin America, it would be a little bit more of a sophisticated awareness of the beauty and richness and culture of Latin America. And then maybe that knowing each other better would always help improve our relations. So did that make sense? Kind of trying to pull those two ideas together? Yeah, definitely. And the idea that, you know, uh, the U.S. was just a couple of decades ahead of these Latin American republics that were being formed. And therefore, that's a I don't know, a, a seniority in sophistication <laughs> that the U.S. presumes yeah. of itself that has perpetuated um, throughout these these centuries, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm still thinking about the settler colonial question, colonialism question. I don't know if the person who asked it has anything or is still here. Yes, so we do have a couple more questions um, and I will jump, since you queued that up, I'll jump, that's the third um, Mr. Lopez is here saying, can you take a shot at the Monroe Doctrine, not as a Latin Americanist, but as an indigenous studies scholar that recognizes the nations that preceded the current nation states of the in the Americas? And I will say, you know, you haven't claimed to be a scholar of indigeneity. Right. So, you know, take that as you yeah. would like to. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. That might be I it might be a little bit out of my um, 
wheelhouse for expertise. So I'm going to go to um, a little bit more of a broader comparative issue, at least what comes to mind is thinking about the United States and say Argentina, Chile and Uruguay, the countries are, you know, again, that's where my work is. I'm, I do popular culture and crossover in Latin American culture, but um, my research tends to focus on the Southern cone. And there is, you know, just similar tendencies that we have in these areas that had non-sedentary indigenous populations that in the 19th century um, were pushed out of the region. And I think sometimes that is another framework through which we might view South America and U.S. history is that the um, the Southern Cone of Latin America and the United States took a positioning of, you know, settler colonialism and decided that eradicating genocide or through pushing out the indigenous populations was going to lead to more material and economic progress. And so certainly if we think about the Monroe Doctrine as this, um, there, there was more Marti that I had at one time that also talks about trade um, and, you know, viewing unfair terms of trade, et cetera. So if we kind of viewed the Monroe Doctrine as this establishing of hegemony in the region that was going to be able to be more successful without building on an indigenous population. I think there is something there. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but I see the same tendencies and processes happen in Argentina, um, which had a conquest of the desert in the 1860s, made the same decision once that barbed wire fencing was possible to push out an indigenous population and a gaucho population rather than to build, um, you know, in, in, in an inclusive way with such a population. So that may not answer that, but that's... Thank you. That, yeah. 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 Um, so to, to move to our other questions, um, we have a um, an attendee who says that, sorry that um, for a late arrival, but please review the relationship between the building of the Pan Panama Canal, direct or indirect. Um, so yeah, the I mean, just briefly, um, again, the story that I don't have time to tell, but I'm very much also intrigued by France's story in all of this, because after building the Suez Canal, France wanted to be the one building the Panama Canal. And I think, again, the ambition of, of Roosevelt in the region, the United States got involved to make sure that wasn't going to happen and worked with uh, people who were then in the province of Colombia to break away from Colombia and to form its own nation. And through that was how the would get permission to build the Panama Canal. So all of that was um, very invent inventionary on the part of Roosevelt. And so at the same time that is happening, that you have Caribbean and Latin American nations that are in debt to Europe. And I think this was a manipulation of the Monroe Doctrine to kind of kill two birds with one stone to get um, Panama to become its own country um, under the guise of the Monroe Doctrine and debt in debting nations, I guess. Uh, France, to me, it's a continual, it's an interesting story because we also mentioned France is involved in Mexico in the mid 19th century, um, has eyes and interest in uh, Panama, Colombia as well. And it is in the 19th century that most scholars credit France with actually coining the term Latin America. Um, I always tell my students that no one speaks Latin in Latin America. And that was an invented term fomented or supported by the French to also have um, affiliation and to argue that they are connected to Latin America through the Romance language and the history of the Roman Empire. Thank you. Um, another question that we have coming in, um, and we do have just a couple more minutes, um, Teddy Roosevelt really became the imperialist. The map showing his corollary actions is pretty eye-opening. 
the George H.W. Bush crisis and intervention in Panama government seems linked, question mark. So is that the question mark? Yeah. That, it, look, it's a great question. I mean, I don't think we can, um, I think Panama history, it is all connected to the beginning. You could even think about the Panama Papers, right? Um, the more recent like discovery that there had been a lot of money funneling through Panama. Anecdotally, my sister was just in Panama and she told me how she was in Cologne, Panama. She witnessed and viewed this very rundown prison and then in Panama City witnessed all of these high rises that were empty. And, you know, I mean, this is anecdote, but I would say everything in Panama is a through line to the creation of the Panama Canal and U.S. Um, interest in the region. And yeah, the kind of overthrow of Norgi Noriega would be part of that story as well. Um, there is a great documentary that I, I worked on, the Panama invasion um, from the 19, right after it happened, uh, that tells that story quite well. I can't remember the links to this earlier history, but, you know, I mean, just broadly thinking about U.S. intervention in the region, it has focused on the Caribbean um, and Mexico, I guess, but in particular in the Caribbean. And this history from the Latin American point of view is also a legacy of the Monroe doctrine. And I'm just going to give a shout out to Latin American history classes. Also, the fact that... Um, we don't teach about Latin America to the extent that I would, of course, like, um, as I always teach and try to think about the Americas together, that we share much in common. But yes, the Monroe Doctrine might be viewed as this point of separation. That is fabulous. And I am so excited for these conversations that could keep going. We do have another point of thanks in the Q&A. We're going to wrap up here in just a second. Um, and I, this, this is really bringing up um, one thing, you know, you mentioned the documentary and I, I, I always encourage people to be history super users, right? I don't want to be the, the beginning and end of people's history exploration. So I'm gonna refer to another outside uh, resource, which um, I was fortunate enough to get to see this week, um, the 1898 US Imperial Visions and Revisions um, exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington. Um, I you can certainly go to the National Portrait Gallery website and have a look through, but many of these questions that we're talking about, about imperialism, um, yes, certainly the role of the Monroe Doctrine, um, the idea of republic versus empire in defining the United States and the ways that was navigated at several points, um, but really focusing on the imperial um, view in 1898, in the War of 1898. So I encourage people to look further um, there and continue exploring history um, after we close this. So um, Kristen, let me thank you for a, a very insightful conversation. I'm just really delighted to have your perspective here and all the um, analysis that you shared with us. Really appreciate that. Let me thank our audience. I'm very glad to have you with us today. Um, we will also um, make this available, so please do um, stay tuned. Also, for more events, um, do look at our website, um, highland.org slash events. Um, I presume that you all may be on our mailing list. Um, we email you at least once a month, but um, not very frequently, so don't be afraid of us filling your inbox. Um, please do sign up to join our mailing list um, at highland.org. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me and thank you all.